We will be looking at Revelation 19, second half of the chapter, so I want to invite you to turn there. And um, for all of you who are here, just full disclosure right up front, this is a section of scripture that is about the judgment and wrath of God. So you might be wondering, gee, what did I just walk into? A whole sermon on judgment and wrath. Well, um, I hope that you'll be able to see that actually seeing the assurance of um, coming judgment and wrath is actually, uh, is this ringing? It seems like it's pretty loud up here, uh, Aiden. I don't know if it needs to come down a hair. Um, is the, the judgment and wrath of God is actually something that for the Christian can be a source of comfort and assurance. And that may seem ironic initially, but I think as we look at this, I hope that um, you'll see how the Lord intends for this um, to affect us and to impact our hearts. So last week, um, we saw the beautiful and glorious event of the marriage supper of the Lamb. God gathering his people in his presence on the final day to be with him forever. Eric did such a great job pointing out that that time is going to be marked by joyous celebration and singing. But in this next section, verses uh, 11 to 21 of chapter 19, John sees something else that's going on on that final day. That even while God is gathering his people to himself for all eternity, he's also pouring out judgment on everyone who rejected him and opposed his rule. So chapters 19 and 20 are depicting the very end of human history. When Christ returns and takes his people home, that's the first half of the chapter, and also, second half, when he destroys all sin and evil. So that's the section uh, I've been tasked to preach on this morning. Chap- verse, chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. I want to invite you to stand as we read together. Hey, Aiden, can you do me a favor and just bring that fader down? Because it, it sounds pretty hot and it's ringy up here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Revelation 19, 11 to 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both slave and free, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Pretty intense passage, right? But this is the word of God. And the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever, and especially as it depicts future events and assures us of what's coming. So let's pray and ask that God's word would have its full effect on our hearts as we look at it together this morning. God, we avail our hearts to you right now, and it's, this is not a section of scripture that we might necessarily willingly turn to in our morning devotions to read, but it is nonetheless your word. And there is truth here that you mean to impact our hearts and stir our uh, affections for you, our awareness of who you are, to produce hope in our hearts, God. And I pray that that and all the other things that you want your word to accomplish would be accomplished this morning through this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the year 2000, 
many of us were cap captivated by one of the most memorable trailers that ever came out, and it was for the movie The Perfect Storm. And if you haven't seen the movie, this is a, about a fishing boat that's at sea when three massive weather systems converge on them, and they're left trying to survive. And the trailer that was so captivating was, it was so captivating because it ends with the boat on this, this near vertical pitch of a wave. And it's, they're facing what is really the most massive wave that anyone's ever seen. And as the boat is going up this wave, the trailer ends. And so you're like, what in the world is going to happen? How, what, how do you end the trailer like that? Of course, it makes you want to go see the movie. And I didn't know how it was going to happen. I don't like to have uh, spoiler alerts and all that. I, I wanted to go, so we watched this movie at some point. And the movie does a great job telling their story leading up to this encounter with a 100-foot wave, which I'll give you the spoiler alert now, which everyone dies. <laughs> so I, I, after that, I was like, no, 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 no. So the movie ends, everyone's dead. No, some, somebody survived. I mean, you know, it, it, rather than being filled with compassion for this crew, who lost their boat and their lives to this storm, you know, my mind is going, well, wait, how do they even know it happened? There's nobody who survived to tell the story. It's not like the Titanic where some people died and they could tell the story. Everyone died? How do they even know? You know, my mind is going there. It was just so unsettling to me. But it was very intriguing. My brother recently sailed from Gulfport, Mississippi to the Florida Keys, and one dark night they encountered a big storm. And they had 15-foot seas, which is not nearly as bad, and wind gusts at 40 to 50 knots, whatever that means. And it was in the pitch black of night for several hours. And they, they actually had to tie themselves to the boat in case they got thrown overboard. Their boat was taken on water, and the, it was the, the bilge pump or whatever. There's all these terms that boaters use that I'm not aware of. It was doing its thing. It was functioning. Thankfully, everyone survived. The wind died down. And uh, they, everyone made it, and it was fine. Well, the book of Revelation is, by the way, one massive spoiler alert, because in the end, Jesus wins. That's the point of the book of Revelation. Jesus wins. Evil is overthrown. But when it comes to facing a storm at sea, you can do what people do, like tie yourself to the boat in case you get thrown overboard. But at some point, you really are at the mercy of the storm, right? Right? <laughs> So after all, like the crew on the boat in the movie soon found out, you may realize that the very thing that you tied yourself to for your survival is no match for the magnitude of the storm. And this is kind of what we see in the book of Revelation. It, it's the vanity of man tying themselves to themselves and their own man-made systems in the vain hope of surviving the wrath of the Lamb. But human ingenuity and cleverness and sophistication are, we see here, are no match for the storm of judgment that is coming. And God is showing us how it all ends because he means for that depiction of how it all ends to actually transform us now. He means for that to have an impact on us in the here and now. So the main point of this sermon is the certainty of future judgment changes how we face present struggles, present obstacles, present experiences, present realities, whatever reality that you're in. And the certainty of future judgment is, is sort of captured in the title of the sermon, which is the glory of Christ in the overthrow of all evil. We see the main character in these 10 verses is the rider on the white horse, who is none other than Jesus. And the certainty of future judgment finds its basis in the first half in terms of who he is, and in the second half in terms of what he does. So the glory of Jesus and the power of Jesus over his enemies. Put simply, Jesus arrives, Jesus conquers. That's how these 10 verses can be split up. <clears throat> There's a simple but very clear certainty to this coming judgment. And that judgment is meant to have an effect on us. It should change how we face present struggles and present obstacles and battles and discouragements and setbacks and pain and suffering and persecution and conflict and everything else that we might face as part of life in a fallen world. So let me ask you, how much does... The future victory of Jesus over sin and evil and suffering. How much does that affect your life and your thinking right now? I confess for me, it does not. I can be very overwhelmed by just what's in front of me. 
and the tasks that I need to get done, that I can neglect these things. And God, by his spirit, though, means for these realities. Yes, even the certainty of future judgment. He means for these realities to be a comfort and assurance to our hearts in whatever we're facing. And so we need this passage to reorient us to life and reality as God sees it. And to remind us where all of this is even heading. And to show us the glory and power of Christ over all the evil that assaults us in the here and now. We need to see this afresh. For some, this reality of future coming judgment will be comforting because we found shelter and refuge in Jesus who is judged in our place. But for others, it will be sobering. For all of us, though, we should be asking this question, in which company do I find myself? Am I in the first half of the chapter, which Eric preached on last week? Am I in the first half of the chapter or the second half? In other words, will I be seated with the saints in heaven Or will I be gathering together in the rebellion of mankind with the false hope that we actually stand a chance against the rider on the white horse? That's the question we should all be asking. Every human being, young, old, churchgoer, non-churchgoer, everyone is in one of those two camps. There is no in-between. So how does this certainty of future judgment affect you? How does it affect me? How does this certainty of future judgment affect affect us, how should it affect us? This is how it's portrayed in these verses. So point one, Jesus arrives in glory. Jesus is arriving in glory. We see this glory in verse 11. If you'd look there, then I saw heaven opened. Heaven opening is often a picture of the glory of God. And Heaven opens and John sees someone riding on a white horse. In ancient times, a king would ride on a white horse through town as part of his victory parade after the battle's been won. And we see that he's called faithful and true. This is set in contrast to the prostitute that we've seen over the last couple of chapters who is unfaithful and never true. But God is faithful and true to his word. In the context of this passage, it's more faithful and true in terms of his judgment. His judgment is what's faithful and true, contextually speaking. Now think about that. The fact that God always keeps his promises, yes, is a wonderful assurance to the believer. He is faithful and true. But for the unbeliever, the fact that God always keeps his promises should be a sheer nightmare. Throughout scripture, he has promised to exact vengeance on all who have rejected his offer of eternal life. Revelation 19 and 20 are a depiction of that vengeance coming to pass. He is faithfully fulfilling all that he promises to do to all of his enemies. He is being 100% true to his holy nature and person, which is why sin must be judged. To merely turn a blind eye to sin or to sweep it under a rug is to be unfaithful to his own character and to compromise the nature of his own perfect justice. In such a case, he would cease to be a faithful and true judge. If that's what he did. But he doesn't do that. He is glorious. He is faithful. He is true. Do you, do you struggle when you come to a passage like this? Like many people do. It would be a common struggle to, to struggle with the idea of God striking down people. And if so, why, why is that a struggle for us? Very often it's because we're thinking of God in human terms. We think it would be wrong if any of us did the things that God is doing. And so it seems reasonable to think that it's therefore wrong if God does it. Well, God is not a sinful human being judging another sinful human being. God is altogether perfect and pure. We are not. God sees all and knows all. We do not. God has revealed the objective reality of right and wrong to us in the Bible, and we have no right to come along and try and redefine that to suit our situation. But when we fail to see these distinctions, then we reduce God to mere man, and we interpret his actions as if it was being carried out by a mere man. Part of the present deception, in fact, is to blur the line between God and man and blur the line between right and wrong. We see this a lot in modern storytelling, right? Especially in the last, say, 10 years or so. There's a tendency these days to portray heroes as both this mixture of good and bad. And in some sense, that's good. We don't want to polish our heroes to make them seem like they were sinless or something like that. We want to be honest about historical hero telling or even even fictional hero telling. So 
any, any movies and books and stuff that you read, there's a tendency to blur that line between good and bad, to blur the line. And, and many movies and show make, shows make the point that right and wrong is, is so blurry that it's, it's really just relative. And so they push against any objective reality or truth. They bask in ambiguity and mock objectivity, in fact. But when the king returns, verse 11, he's always faithful and true. He does not blur the line. He is perfect in his judgments. Verse 12 goes on to say that his eyes are like a flame of fire. He sees everything and everyone. He sees, guys, that means he sees through our pretenses and our masks. He makes no mistakes. He judges rightly every time. There is no ambiguity with God. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Hebrews 4.13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of, whom, of him to whom we must give account. And it tells us he judges in righteousness. That means when he executes judgment, it is never impure or sinful. It's never cruel. The judgments of God are not God flying off the handle like we might do. He is not like a human. He is not like a human justice system either. Who, which sometimes gets it wrong. No, he judges in righteousness every time. He fulfills what he promises to do in his capacity as righteous judge. He is faithful and true. Remember the, the doxology in Romans chapter 11 says, how unsearchable are your judgments? How inscrutable are your ways? He is righteous, faithful, and true in all his judgments, and none of his judgments does he commit wrong. On his head, verse 12 tells us there are many diadems. In those days, kings would wear a diadem, which is a headband of sorts made out of cloth with jewels attached to it. And these diadems would show which kingdom the king has conquered. Kind of like football players who put the stickers on their helmet, you know, however many sacks or interceptions. And, you know, they, they kind of attest to their accomplishments. That's what a diadem was. We're told that this writer has many diadems showing his widespread authority and dominion over all things things. Then we have this interesting phrase in verse 12 that he has a name that no one knows but himself. Now it's interesting because obviously we are given some names here. We're given about three names. But there's also a name no one knows but himself. There's different interpret interpretations of this phrase, but many scholars believe that this is referencing the hidden depths of God. Certainly the Bible gives us everything we need to know about the infinite God that we serve, but that's not to say that we know him exhaustively. Right? 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us that we still see in part. We prophesy in part. In other words, there are aspects of God and his eternal nature that we may never fully grasp this side of eternity. It would be great to have all the answers, right? It sure would be great, but we are not promised that. There are aspects of who he is that we cannot know exhaustively. He is that holy, that righteous, that transcendent, that there's a name that no one knows but himself. We see in verse 13 that he's, his robe, he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, which is a reference to his atoning work and how the, at the cross, he overcame the enemy at the cross, didn't he? We see in Revelation 12, 11 that they, the saints conquered the enemy by the blood of the lamb, right? So the way the enemy is conquered is by the blood of the lamb and the, the blood dipped robe that is pictured in the symbolism is underscoring that point for the readers. In verse 13, he's called the word of God. Although elsewhere, John uses the logos to refer to Christ. Here, it's a slightly different use. He's making the point here that, that Jesus, this writer, being the word of God, is the full embodiment of divine expression. He is the speech of God, as it were, executing judgment of God upon people. He is the, the word, the divine self-expression of God himself. Along with him are, verse 14, the armies of heaven. Elsewhere in the Bible, armies of heaven refers to the angels, but here it is most likely the saints because they're arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, reminding us of things we've seen earlier in the book. And here too, they are riding white horses behind Jesus. Verse 15, he has a sharp sword and, and coming, protruding out of his mouth which which to strike down the nations, and he'll rule them, it says, with a rod of iron. Notice here that it's Jesus himself 
who strikes down the rebellion and eradicates all evil. All the saints are with him, but they are not the ones tasked with carrying out his wrath. Some Christians think it's their job to bring wrath down on God's enemies. No, the saints here are with Jesus, but Jesus is the only one who is the perfect and righteous judge. And he's the only one who has the the right and authority to exact vengeance upon his enemies. And we stand behind him, along with him in this scene, as he carries that out. Verse 16, we see that he's called on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, it's interesting for the other three, uh, we're simply told that these are the names by which he was called. But for this phrase, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we're told that it's written on his robe and it's written on his thigh. So, yes, it sounds like Jesus had a tattoo on his thigh that said, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is how Christ arrives in glory. As the almighty, all-powerful king who rules over all and whose authority cannot be thwarted or challenged. Now, let's just pause for a moment. That's a lot of intense, heavy stuff, right? So let's just pause and think, how should these realities affect our lives right now? Well, if you're trusting in Christ, oh, brother and sister, take comfort in the fact that one day he will eradicate all evil and all pain all suffering, all injustice, all brokenness. He will wipe it off the face of the earth. Are you ready for that to happen? We should be ready for that to happen. We should be longing that that happen. This is the hope that the Christian has. We we live in the tension now, don't we? That's for sure. But we have a hope that one day he's going to wipe it all away. And we will see him face to face. We'll feast with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb, first half of the chapter. But for the present time, we live in the tension. So what do we do with that? Well, just think of our own personal sin struggles. Every sin, and apply it to your own personal sin struggle. Every sin and temptation that you face will one day be struck down. And you will be fully and finally free. Does something in your heart well up and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, do it soon. (laughs) Let it break into my life right now. God, please. You know, we sing the song, the the demons we've been fighting, those without and those within, meaning there's demonic opposition both within the ranks of the visible people of God as well as out there in the world. And and the song goes on and says, they will be underneath our feet to never rise again. All our sins will be behind us through the blood of Christ erased. And we'll taste your goodness and kindness when we see your face. Oh, be comforted by this coming reality. Do you long for this? Do you look with hope to this coming day? This is part of the certainty of how it all ends in coming judgment. The judgment that we look for is a judgment that wipes all of this away. Now you're starting to see how the judgment and wrath of God is a comfort for the believer. Because he's eradicating evil from your life and from the earth. What about just suffering in the world? Homelessness, poverty, Child abuse, racism, these broken things that we live with. Well, we are comforted by the fact that in the new heavens and the new earth, which comes shortly after Revelation 19 and 20, the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no brokenness. All things will be made new. And that's hopeful for us. And until then, oh, may our hearts break when we see the effects of sin on humanity and on creation. May we think and communicate with our children something to the effect of this should not be so. You know, when they bump into the fallenness of the world around them, why is that person on the street corner looking for handouts? Why do I get stickers in my foot that make me cry? And when they bump into the tension of life in a fallen world, we want to instill in them the hope that it should not be so and one day it will not be so. And we we give them this story of the coming judgment that one day Jesus will wipe it all away. And until then, oh, we want to think and communicate this way. We want to identify the point of tension in the story of our lives and then map that onto this grand story that culminates here in Revelation 19 and 20. Even just relational conflict, we see that it's God who brings justice, not us. That means we can trust him to be our judge When we've been wronged, we don't need to take justice into our hands 
and be God to other people, be the judge to others. What about persecution? Persecution is probably the most immediate application uh, for the original readers. And this passage is, is assuring these original readers that God will vindicate his people. Because at the same time that he's sitting down with them at the marriage supper of the Lamb in verses 1 through 10, at the same time that's happening, he's carrying out vengeance on everyone else who remains. Now remember, we, we've said it, and Eric said it, and Pastor Billy said it. When we come to Revelation, these are visual symbols meant to convey spiritual realities. It's very important. So it's not always necessarily meant to be read literalistically or linearly or chronologically. The, the writer is going to paint multiple scenes that are happening at the same time. And so I think that's what's happening in, in chapter 19 here is while this marriage supper of the lamb is going on and the lamb is here, there's this other thing where the rider on the white horse, who is also the lamb hosting the dinner, is carrying out judgment and, you know, how can, how can all these things be happening at once? Well, Jesus is not limited to space and time. And, and we're not meant to get hung up on those details. He's portraying the end of time and what is taking place. So at the same time that he's feasting with his people, he's carrying out vengeance on everyone else who remains. He's overthrowing the beast and the false prophet and his armies. Jesus will have the last word over his people, not his people's enemies. I think that's the primary comfort of this passage to the original readers and therefore should be the comfort for our own hearts. This is the glory that will mark his arrival at the second coming. Jesus arrives in this kind of glory. Point number two, he conquers in power. Looking at verse 17 to 21, this angel calls on birds of prey and invites them to the great supper of God. Um, I have a special appreciation to see birds being used and in, in synonymous with the wrath of God because if you know me, I don't like birds. I'm very afraid of birds. I've been attacked multiple times in my life by birds. I know you don't believe me, but it's true. And um, so when I see this, I'm like, see, they're a product of the fall and God is using them. No, if, you, if you're a bird lover, that's good. I, I need my theology. <laughs> I will pray for you, and, I, and you could pray for me. Um, I, I really do have a fear of birds. It probably has something to do with the fact that my parents took me to see birds in 3D when I was about five years old, and uh, it was terrifying. But maybe it's unrelated. But here, <laughs> the, these birds are called upon to a feast. It's, they're invited to a supper. And what's on the menu for this supper? It's kind of gross. It's the bodies of everyone that this divine warrior will slay. Fitting for birds, nasty things they are. The, the outcome, though, the point of all of this is that the outcome is so certain that the angel is telling them beforehand, hey, birds, get ready. You're about to have a feast. We don't want to miss the contrast here either. So we're told about the great supper of God where the birds feast on the flesh of God's enemies but earlier in the chapter, we learned about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you see the, the contrast. There's two suppers going on where God's people are feasting on his goodness and mercy. And the birds are feasting on all of those that God has judged. And so for us, that just begs the question, what feast are you going to be at? Will you be eating or getting eaten? Now remember, this is symbolic language, but it, it's meant to provoke these questions. Do we find ourselves in verses 1 and 10? Or do we find ourselves in verses 11 to 21 thinking that we're going to overthrow the rider on the horse only to be defeated and eaten by birds? Again, symbols meant to convey graphic, serious, spiritual realities. Will there be literally birds eating literal flesh? Not likely. But these are depictions of the, the horror and disgustingness of what is going to take place as part of God's judgment upon sin. Notice the list of people in verse 18 shows that all God's enemies will be judged. No one's getting off the hook because they're a person of power or wealth or have the right connections. James Hamilton put it this way, the point of Revelation 19.18 is that neither status, influence, nor significance will exempt anyone from God's justice. And I love what he says here. The gospel is a leveler of persons because neither wealth nor status brings anyone closer to God than another. Everyone is in need of the justification by faith in Christ. But the judgment is also a leveler of persons 
because neither advantage nor disadvantage will affect the justice of God. You ever thought about that? The gospel's a leveler, but, but so is the justice of God. No one's exempt. No one has special privileges on either side. We all need Jesus. And here's the most absurd part of this whole thing. Verse 19, we see that the beast and the kings of the earth are with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the white, on the white horse. I mean, right up until the very end, they actually think that they stand a chance against the Almighty. What on earth? Man left to himself will always think that he can topple God. To modern man, God either doesn't exist or the way they think of him is he's an elderly weakling stuck in the past, remembering the glory days when people actually were afraid of him. And, but he's basically incompetent and irrelevant for life in a modern world. I mean, after all, science has replaced the knowledge that God provides. Media has replaced the joy that God provides. Money has replaced the riches that God provides. Technological power has replaced the security that God provides. Conclusion, God is unnecessary and irrelevant. That's the, the mindset of modern man. No wonder they gather thinking that they have a chance to get them off their backs for good. But what is God's reaction to this sheer vanity and deception on behalf of sinful man to think that he will actually be successful? So I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 2 with me. This whole chapter tells us how God regards man in his effort to overthrow God. Chapter 2 of Psalms, Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? It's in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, saying against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. Right, this is what's happening in Revelation. Let's get God off our backs for good. We can do it. Let's just band together. We can do it. And look, what, look at God. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to him in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That, that's the part right there where it's, it's extending that offer to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, to forsake the army that gathers, thinking it's going to overthrow the Lamb, and instead join the feast that he's extended to everyone. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. And I love how it ends. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's a wonderful theological paradox. The beauty of the gospel is in this paradox that's often been stated. Is we are saved from God by God. God saves us from himself. We, what we mean by that is that God in his love has provided a means that we might be saved from the wrath that we rightly deserved as sinners who stand condemned before him. So blessed are all those who take refuge in the one who might destroy you in the way if you don't take refuge in him, Psalm 2 is saying. Powerful verse. But note, coming back to Revelation 19, note that there is not even a battle, is there? They line up for battle, but they're not even given a chance. Is God being unfair there? Well, let's just remember that sinful man has been waging war against God ever since the garden. God has granted him chance after chance, hasn't he? He's patiently allowed them to resist his authority and persecute and kill his people. He's longingly waited and called for them to turn from their wicked ways, to, as, as we see in the Old Testament, to come to the waters and drink, but they were not willing. And now the time has come. The day of their rebellion is over. And they're thinking they're lining up for this last showdown, but it's actually the final overthrow. They have had their chance. They thought they were being successful, but now is the moment of truth. And the greatest tragedy in all of the world is to arrive at that moment and suddenly realize 
The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Do not delay. If, if you might find yourself in that position, while you still have breath, that breath that God gives you, that you're still alive, is an expression of his patience towards you, saying you still can turn to me and turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in me, and I will forgive you. Don't run from him. Don't ignore him. He is beckoning you now, and one day that voice will go silent, and it will be too late. I, I pray this and long for this for our children. Praise God that we have so many kids growing up in church. It's a wonderful thing. But as the gospel falls upon their ears, Lord, save their souls. Turn their hearts to you. Open their blind eyes to see the vanity of self-reliance and selfishness and pride. And turn their hearts to you, God, that they might be saved. Let them see the beauty of Christ extending this offer of peace and salvation from judgment to them. Lord, capture their hearts at a young age, even as you captured mine at 10 years old. God, do it for many 10-year-olds. Do it for the 5-year-olds. Do it for everyone in between, Lord. This is what we pray. This is what we long for. We know that these realities of coming judgment are, are in front of us. And God is putting them before our eyes. And he means for this to become a, a, a way that he might save people, young and old. Churched and unchurched. God, do it for your glory. Verses 20 to 21, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Their followers are all slain and the birds gorge themselves with their flesh. The picture here, total destruction. What's the point? Jesus will judge and eradicate all evil. And justice is coming for all who oppose him. Evil, both in its presence and its source, will be completely eradicated. So Christian, let this assure your heart. So often we struggle with the problem of evil, don't we? It came up recently in a women's class that I was leading. The reality is that, and it's given to us here in chapter 19, um, that these verses can actually really help us with this struggle that we often have about the problem of evil. What is the problem of evil? Well, the problem of evil goes something like this. We believe that God is all powerful and all good or all loving. So the problem of evil says the fact that evil still exists shows that God is either not all powerful or he's not all good. But the existence of evil means he can't be both powerful and good. In other words, if God is all good and evil exists, he may not like evil because he's all good, but he must, not, he must have been too weak to stop it which means he's not all-powerful. On the other hand, if God is truly all-powerful and he lets evil exist, then he must not be all-good because it was in his power to stop it and he did nothing about it. That's how it goes. But this passage reminds us, actually, that he never does nothing about it. Every sinful act, every injustice, every evil deed, every disgusting crime committed, and every vile thing that ever existed will be judged. We might not see it now, and so we think that he does nothing about it, but it will be judged. So picture it this way. Every wicked, filthy, vile evil is flowing downhill. You, you know the expression, it flows downhill. It, it's flowing downhill into a cesspool of iniquity. Let's just picture this. In other words, all evil is, is flowing down into this container. It's being captured and contained. And what we see here is that one day it will be scooped up and thrown into the lake of fire by the all-powerful, all-loving God who rides on a white horse with final victory in his hand. No evil deed will ever go unpunished. And this is an expression of his both power and his goodness. The presence of evil does not cancel out either of those. But then you might say, well, that's future. It's, that's a future thing that's coming. Isn't it unloving to permit these things now? Well, behind that question is often the assumption that prevention is the only way for God to be all loving. 
But is it possible, actually, that God is working through the evil, sinful rebellion of mankind to bring about his greater purposes? I know from a human perspective, we may wonder what good could possibly come out of a particular evil. But we also know that God ordained, not just used, the greatest evil ever committed in human history to bring about the greatest good that could ever come to humanity, the redemption of mankind. And union with the Father, Creator, eternal life in heaven, he brought all of that out of the greatest evil that was ever committed? If he can do that, then could the evil sin and suffering that he permits not actually be the absence of him being all-loving, but the very expression of it? An expression of the ultimate good that he is achieving, emerging from his intrinsic nature of pure goodness and pure limitless power? Yes. Even from a human perspective, when he doesn't prevent evil or immediately punish it, that's the assumption, we think that would be the best option. But even when he doesn't prevent evil or immediately punish it, one thing we can say for sure is that it's his delay in judgment. And that delay in judgment is, in fact, patient and loving toward his enemies. Not wanting that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But one day, time will run out for those who do not repent. On the other hand, for those who trust in Jesus, oh, the certainty that one day God will judge evil and eradicate it completely. Oh, it just puts things in perspective now. Here's a few ways. For one, it should stir up hope in our hearts. That whatever persecution we may be called to face, whatever sacrifices we make for the kingdom now, will all be worth it in the end. Do we think that living the Christian life should be absent of sacrifice or pain? Or, you know, might you not be able to take a particular job or play a particular sport? I had to make this decision when I was in high school when a particular sport was going to really pull me out of church, which was a means of life for my soul. God intends it to be that way. There are sacrifices we make that don't necessarily fall under the realm of, you might get your head chopped off for being a Christian. It might not be that, but what sacrifices are we making? It's God calling us to make for the good of our own souls, for the advancement of his kingdom. Whatever sacrifices we may make, This book of Revelation, in particular this passage, wants to assure us that it will all be worth it in the end. And that should put hope in our hearts. It should also call us away from the vanity of sinful pleasure and pursuits. Because we recognize that one day all of that's going to be judged and destroyed anyway. And if we're trusting in Christ now, Christ died to liberate us from the tyranny of this beast. And so this calls us out of those sinful ways And calls us into holiness and purity and righteousness. Finally, it grants perspective on how we approach our work. Now by work, it it may be in terms of vocation. Like you go to a job or you work from home. It might be (coughs) the very full-time job of parenting. In which you never clock out. Um, However you want to view work. The mundane stuff of life can be treated two ways. One, we can see those things. We can see work as either ultimate or we can see them as significant. And both views are wrong. And both will set us up for disappointment. So my job or, or, or my vocation is not ultimate. If I live my life like it is and my work and I work my job like it is and give myself to my work like my work is ultimate, I'm missing the reality that my joy, peace, and happiness can only come from Christ, not my accomplishments. And this passage reminds me that. Eventually, my misplaced hope will disappoint. On the other hand, my my work is not insignificant either. If I see my work as just a chore, as something that just gets in the way of personal fulfillment, as a necessary evil that I have to do in order to make money to survive and just need to make the best of it, but it's not really... It's not really any point to it as some unfortunate reality that I just have to live with until I win the lottery or something where I don't have to work anymore. Then I'm reducing my work to less than what God intends it to be for me. 
So whatever side you gravitate towards, this text reminds you that yes, the world is still broken and sinful. And yes, the day is coming when all of that brokenness and sinfulness will be wiped away. And Jesus will conquer his enemies. And every evil will be done away with. And in fact, the reason God left us on the earth after he saved us was to leave a testimony of that coming reality in our witness and in our work. So we're to be the people who live and work in such a way that a bit of that future reality that we're reading about breaks into the present reality and whets people's appetite for what's to come. This is what it means to be salt and light in the earth, to be a city on a hill, right? The certainty of coming judgment compels us to live for the good of others, especially their eternal good. It frees us from placing our hope, as we sing in that song, placing our hope in what will be destroyed. It grants us peace that God will one day right every wrong and judge every evil person who has not fled to Jesus. Sin will be fully and finally done away with. And until then, we want to be the people who live like that's true, who live in the good of that future hope, that it it compels our hearts, it animates our faith. This is what God intends for us. Now, Joshua, if you want to bring the team and close in a song, I want to bring out one last point as part of this conclusion. And I love this part. In that day, when he treads, the, there's this phrase, when he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. What a phrase. In that day, we will know it's all over. Sin will be wiped away. And in that, we will be filled with the deepest gratitude. Why gratitude? Picture the scene that is painted for us. Jesus is on the horse. The armies of the saints are behind him, also riding white horses, clothed in fine linen, watching this destruction take place. It's sobering. But what will we feel in that moment? We will see in that moment firsthand what we all deserved. We will not be going, yeah, that's right, serves you right. We'll be going, I should have been down there. Why me, Lord? We'll be filled with gratitude. How is it possible that I find myself seated on a white horse behind Jesus and not in the company of those opposing him? We'll realize in a fuller sense than we do now that the reason this is all possible is because the wrath that fell on them which should have fallen on us, but didn't, happened because it fell on Jesus in our place. I mean, another way to say it, the elephant in the room, as we watch sinful humanity being struck down by the sword of Jesus, is that we too are sinful, and yet we're not being struck down. Why? What on earth happened? Well, there's a play on words here in verse 15, in the phrase, rule them with a rod of iron. You might see a little superscript next to the word rule in your Bible, and it Another, the the word in Greek is actually shepherd. He will shepherd them with a rod of iron. In other words, the king who executes vengeance is also the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. In fact, you remember one of the ways Jesus described his death was by quoting a passage from Zechariah. And he refers to his own death as strike the shepherd. And the sheep will be scattered. Remember that? So, the reason we are not struck down in judgment is because our shepherd was struck down for us in judgment and yet emerged victorious from the grave so that all who would put their faith and trust in him would be spared from the judgment that we so rightly deserved. And though we were once scattered and far off from God, we have been gathered in and brought to his side and seated at his table, verses 1 to 10, last week's message. If you didn't hear it, go listen to that. That means we will be fully spared from the coming judgment because the shepherd was judged. He was struck down in our place, receiving the judgment that we deserved. That's how the certainty of coming judgment can and should transform how we face our present struggles. So anytime we feel the tension of life in a fallen world, the lostness and brokenness of the world, the pain of life on this side of eternity. Oh, let us remind ourselves of this truth that one day Jesus will bring an end to it all and we will enjoy him forever. 
And this is the Jesus that we get to look to and celebrate every Sunday when we gather. This is the Jesus who speaks to us from his word every time we open it up. This is the Jesus who means to impart hope into our hearts when we're weary and we're discouraged and we've lost sight of why we're doing the things that we're doing in our life. Because the glory of Christ is to be seen and felt and enjoyed by all of God's people and it will be especially so when he overthrows all evil. And that coming certainty, uh, the certainty of coming judgment changes, transforms, shapes how we face present realities. Let's stand together and sing this song together that really captures so much of what we're talking about.